Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. I want to thank uh, my friends at JICA Research Institute for our partnership. We're releasing a report today and tomorrow called Transformative Innovation for International Development. Um, and we're going to be talking about the role of technologies and transformation in, in the context, in the urban context, or making cities livable. And I think uh, the report does a very good job of um, expanding upon the issue of what is a smart city and how we make city life more livable. This is a much more serious and pressing issue given that most of the world, now the majority of the world lives in cities and there is going to be a rapid increase in urbanization over the next 20 years of which much of this is going to happen in Asia and Africa. So the issues of technology, the issues of capable governance to meet basic human needs, and the issue of quality infrastructure are all components that are going to be needed in the, to make cities livable. Um, I want to thank uh, Helen Moser, who's the author of the report, who's back there, and uh, for doing such a fine job on this. I encourage you all to read the report. Uh, we've, got, uh, um, we've got a number of really thoughtful speakers who've come from a long distance to be with us. I'm going to start with uh, turning over the floor to An Anthony Vanke from MIT, and then I'm going to ask uh, my friend Dr. Catano to present a PowerPoint to present the findings of, our, of this part of the report, and then we're going to go to a, to a panel. So without further ado, Anthony, I'm going to ask you to come on up. All right, I'm also going to uh, set a timer so that you can actually get great conversation and I don't monopolize an entire day. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit about what we do from our little corner of Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, on the MIT campus. You know, in the context of smart cities, I think that there's a, this, the problem with the smart city is that you can talk about almost anything and you can say it's smart. So I'll kind of uh, focus my conversation around uh, a few ideas and really show it through the work of our lab. Part of our collaboration, though, is really with our collaborators from companies and cities from around the world um, who really provide um, the information, the infrastructure, um, as well as the living laboratory to really engage with citizens. Because I think that's actually one of those other aspects that we don't often talk about, the citizenry. Because I think the challenge that we have <clears throat> And dealing with smart cities is much more fundamental. It's about the cities in which we live. Cities are just easily, just 2% of the Earth's crust in a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of our physical landscape on this planet. But they house over 50% of the world's population. And of course, that number is actually higher now. It's 75% of energy consumption, 80% of t CO2 emissions. So a small change on our Earth's planet, on our crust, actually has profound impacts for all of humanity. And what we do is we look at this. This is the context that people often think about with a smart city. Quite literally, what you're looking at is every SMS message, every phone call, uh, every hello, goodbye, how are you? Hey, let's do lunch. Congratulations on the business deal. Hey, maybe we should see other people. This is literally one week's worth of cell phone activity from all over the world um, visualized uh, as a single little graph. We call this the signature of humanity. The data came from the Ericsson Global Backbone Network that is actually uh, supporting a lot of the telcos that we know internationally. But when you actually look at this data, crack it open, and actually look at the possibilities of trying to understand people through the dust that we leave behind, through that residue, through that exhaust, there's actually a lot of power when you look at smart cities. But I don't like using the word smart, personally, because to quote someone from Harvard, uh, Susan Crawford, she says smart is simplistic, mechanistic, anarchistic, reductive, tautological. Basically, input in, output out. You know, everything is formulaic and will happen in the most optimized way possible. Well, I don't think that's quite right. And I don't really think um, cities should be sensible all the time with the traditional spelling. Because when was the last time you went to Paris because everything was operationally wonderful? No, you go for the charms, you go for the inefficiencies. And actually, sometimes those are the magical aspects of a city. So for us, we come up with this little funny spelling that word hates. You always get the little red jaggy line when we spell it. Because it's the idea that we are able to sense. Able to sense this. The, that five ex exabytes of data, that thing that I had just shown. That five exabytes of data is the amount of information that we produced since the dawn of humanity to the year 2003. An incredible amount of data. 
It's also the same amount of data that we now produce every 24 hours. Mm. That's profound. But of course, it's not just us talking to each other. It's also us using devices, talking to the internet. Increasingly, machines talking to the internet and machines talking to each other. So going to that idea of sensible with a funny spelling, that idea of sensing, for us, that, quote, smartness, comes from the idea of creating new ways to understand the city, new ways to maybe change how we use the city so public transportation can get improved, but it's also creating new devices that we haven't seen before or looking at different questions. It's really the way that people, spaces, and information can all relate together and kind of perhaps not just a human computer interface if you're a techie, but a human computer city interface. All right, so no more polemics. Um, I'll start off with uh, you know, a project that we're doing on the other side of the world. We actually have a sister lab in Singapore. We're about 40 people in Cambridge. We have about 10 in Singapore. Um, and we're about to start one up in Amsterdam, so uh, apologies for the bad um, kind of metaphor, but the sun will never set on Sensible uh -huh. at some point. So, um, But when people talk about smart cities, this often comes up. You know, this was the real-time economic control room for the government of Chile during the Allende period. So basically what you would have is old wise men sitting in these chairs looking at indicators you know, on those screens, basically using uh, the telex, the precursor to the fax machine, and literally using those buttons on those chairs, deciding the course of the economy. More sugar, less corn, more oil. Suffice it to say, this idea didn't quite work. Uh, and lo and behold, in 2012, humanity did it again. This time in Rio de Janeiro. And these are actually cool now. Every city wants a real-time control room. And there's actually a lot of opportunities with this. You know, you can actually see what's going on in the city. You can make a, you know, you can have dashboards and really kind of, you know, uh, put people in different parts of the city as they're needed. But we think that there's perhaps another model as well because that device in your pocket right now has more processing power than the U.S. government had to send man to the moon. So maybe it's not just this poor person in the corner making all the decisions. What if everyone could make decisions? What if everyone could have access? to that same data, looking at the internet of the city. But how do you create protocols? How do you create an infrastructure? How do you create tools for people to begin to integrate all of this? Could you create a platform for real-time data in the same way that these open data systems have created it for uh, historic data? So I'll show you a series of visualizations that was our first experiment, literally working with data providers in Singapore that had never actually shared their data with anyone else before. And how do you create a common conversation with both policy, but also creating economic models where they, you actually want to share data? So we worked with uh, a variety of people um, from an academic partner of ours with CINSAM, uh, the Changi, the airports, Comfort Del Gro, uh, public transportation, National Environmental Agency, the ports, telco, and uh, utilities. And to actually begin that conversation, what that smart city, what that, that new city could look like with data, we actually partnered with the Singapore Art Museum to actually create, for the first time, a public display of that data that's being pro uh, produced in their community. And these are some of those interactive visualizations. So all of these visualizations were being created in real time, and that people could actually interact with them as the data was actually being sent. So first, using anonymized cell phone data, looking at where the population is. So in the middle of the day, you can actually pick out the central business district and then people dispersing back to the residential areas. Looking at the relationship between energy consumption and uh, the, the urban environment, so actually looking at how air conditioning is actually making the urban environment warmer, therefore causing a vicious cycle of energy consumption. Looking at social media data and cell phone data to look at uh, what's happening during special events. So the city can be excited. That's all fine and good, but again, how do you make this public? 
you know, these visualizations, I think, are beautiful, but those were only just kind of as an example of what you can do. And our vision is actually a little bit more grounded. Um, for time, I won't show all the visualizations, but I'll tell you a, a quick story. Uh, I was based out in our Singapore lab about two years ago, and one of my lab mates was having a birthday, and his grandmother wanted to surprise him with just kind of a few baked goods. She came in to the lab, and unfortunately, she was soaked. She was caught in the rain. Uh, and for an island, you know, uh, that has very low car ownership, everyone's walking or using public transportation. And we looked at the data. We actually looked at her trip. Uh, she told us what she did, and so we could actually tap it. It's not like, you know, we were tracking her card or something. That's perhaps a little too creepy. Um, and what we noticed was uh, she actually was in a very crowded bus. Um, she had told us this too, that she ended up standing for the whole route. Mm -hmm. um, and she was caught in the rain because uh, she was running a little bit late, so she, caught, uh, so she had to walk to the next station uh, to catch the bus that would have gotten her to, uh, to NUS, the, the university. But we found that actually if she had just waited another three minutes at that same bus stop, that first bus stop, there was actually another bus that would have gotten to her actually faster than the original bus. Um, and that bus was empty. She could have actually had a seat. So if you think about all the money that we spend in public transportation, we always want the new line, but actually with very little cost, but actually opening this data and in a way creating an interface for her to actually see the most comfortable route, not just the next route, would have actually been, you know, gotten there in the same amount of time and actually been, uh, would have just come a few minutes later, which actually changes the paradigm. No additional cost for the public transportation system, but actually giving their customers a greater quality of experience which I think goes back to the idea of that sensible, that the ability to sense idea and not just smart. So we're gonna look at another type of infrastructure, but this time a little bit closer to home. Our good friends in the north in New York City. Uh, we re recently received a data set of um, their taxi rides over one year, and it's about 13,500 taxis. And if anyone's ridden a taxi, even in uh, the city of Washington, we know the perils of riding a taxi. You have three o'clock, too many taxis, not enough people. Uh, five o'clock, too many people, not enough taxis. And then the airport where all hell breaks loose. You have too many people and too, ma too many taxis. Uh, everything kind of breaks down. So for us, applying our urban imagination and really thinking not just computationally, but what are the opportunities, could you think about a new model? But first, we just wanted to visualize that data. So what you're looking at is it's a little washed out here, are all those pickups and drop-offs. And if any of you have been to New York recently, you know if you're trying to get a taxi to Brooklyn, it's a little difficult, let alone trying to get one back into Manhattan. But this map that you're seeing isn't actually the roads. It's actually made up by the individual pickups and drop-offs, all 170 million trips made during that year. So already you already have an intuition of some of these challenges for New York. But for us, thinking about what is an opportunity with big data analytics, we want to ask, what would happen if people did something very simple? Maybe less simple for New Yorkers. What if they shared a ride with someone else? Just simply that, what if you shared a ride? So you want to actually look at kind of a, a mathematical model of kind of shareability networks. How does that network, what is the reach of the network and how does it evolve if you share? And using some uh, quantitative aspects, uh, you know, a little bit of math, um, actually modeling that. And of course we grounded this with some of the real things that we deal with regularly in our lives. Uh, you are not gonna share a ride if it's gonna add an additional hour onto your trip. So we just have very simple inputs actually. Um, you know, your total delay tolerance, just a couple minutes. You know, the density of trips, how many trips are in that area and how many of them are within reach. And we actually found something amazing. If New Yorkers are willing to do two simple things. Number one, share their ride. And number two, we're willing to add a tolerance of two minutes onto their trip. So either two minutes longer at the beginning or at the end, you can reduce the number of rides in New York by 40%. Whoa. Now, this is gonna be tough for New Yorkers. Let's increase that time to five minutes, a whole five minutes. You can reduce the number of rides by 90% because of the duplication. Now you have to think, one of the first things that Mayor Bloomberg did when he went into office, he tried implementing road congestion pricing into the island of Manhattan in the end completely failed, lost some political capital as a result. But now if we just rethink that infrastructure of actually sharing, you know, you can create new economic models. What if each taxi driver just charged 75% of the fare if they're willing to share? Well, that driver of sharing, they just made an additional 50% of uh, additional revenue and two minutes of cost. So you can actually find a lot of efficiencies in this. Of course, you know, that, um, 
you know, started a conversation that we had with uh, a small San Francisco-based company, um, which some of you may know. Actually, I'll let someone else talk about that small company and what they're doing. Um, but for us, I think going back to that idea of that public, if we just published this graph in the New York Times, no one would care. Actually, half the people won't even understand what it says. I don't even know. Half of the people might, in this room might not know what it says either. Um, how do you actually make it personable? So we actually created this website called hubcap.org, which you can actually go in your, your free time. If you have a computer, you're welcome to go to it now, where you can actually pick any two points in the city of New York and actually see that sharing potential. So let's say Donald Trump decided to take uh, the train and a taxi for some reason, going up to Trump Tower just a little bit. Between Grand Central Station and Columbus Circle, there's about 800,000 trips between just two, two, those two points in one year. The amazing thing is, is that if New Yorkers were willing to share, they could have saved $3.5 million in fares. They could have reduced about a million miles of travel and about over 400,000 uh, kilograms of CO2. That has profound savings in many ways. That's the triple bottom line right there of economy, you know, um, environment. You know, that's everything. That's looking at it there. But the power with this visualization and making it public is that you can actually find your own trips like this. New Yorkers taking taxis between two corners of the same block. Okay, let alone walking. Um, but the fact that 45,000 you know, 45, people are taking trips between those two points is ridiculous as it is. Let alone, they, they could have saved $77,000 of fares, let alone just walking. But, you know, but I think this is the power of the data. You can actually see kind of these different stories. This is something where computation by itself would have just missed. But actually beginning to think about that storytelling aspect, to share kind of this, this innovation becomes really powerful. Taking kind of this idea of transportation to the next level, we've all seen those cutesy little Google cars, you know, on TV or something like that. And, you know, and of course, you know, a lot of people are really looking forward to what automation may bring us. And we've been looking at that too, but looking at it again through that city lens, especially when devices start talking to each other. What if that street light is talking to your car, not just your car trying to sense that environment? particularly when we think that the street light is actually a very old technology. It dates back to the horse and buggy, and very little has actually changed in the 150 years we've had street lights. But we think that there's actually an opportunity looking forward with automation. What if it's not just a car trying to decide whether it's gonna enter an intersection, but much like you flying into you know, National or flying into Dulles, it's actually kind of a slot-based system, assigning a time to go through. Could you actually find greater efficiencies? So creating a, can, a mathematical model that deals with things like safety, um, the, what we call kind of incompatible uh, networks, so people basically traveling in opposite directions, you know, people going into an intersection. How do you build all of this? What are the potential opportunities when you look at an intersection? There are many mathematical models. I'm not going to get into this. Um, but we actually looked at it through a single intersection close to home for us, right in Boston. So we'll zoom in in a second. For the numerical people, significant savings over the best that we've got. So the first one, the green one, is an average traffic light. You know, uh, then you have the first come, first serve system, but then also the adapter, the fully technological. And this is actually a reality that's coming down the pike. That it's not just you know the smart car. What if the city actually becomes a player into this as well? That the city can also manage that infrastructure. Now I'll actually become a little more personal, and we'll go down to one. 
probably the last technological trend I'll talk about is that idea of things talking to each other. And we talked with Qualcomm a few years ago thinking about uh, what does it mean when objects talk to each other? And you know, if this podium talks to me, I don't really care about the stories it has to tell. But it's amazing though that we know how this podium was made. We know where all the bits came from. We know where the wood came from. Same thing with your computer. The interesting thing is, if you throw this computer away, we actually have no idea. So for us as a question is, to talk about this new paradigm of technology, could we actually make you care about the thing you care the least about? which is a thing you throw away. So we actually partnered with the city of Seattle and the company Waste Management. And using little tags, which you'll see in a moment, we actually wanted to see where trash goes. So these were little tags that we first developed, and then uh, Qualcomm came out with something that we could hack. Uh, basically, there's cell phones that can't make phone calls, have GPS, and the batteries last four months. Um, and with 500 volunteers who brought us 3,000 pieces of trash, we wanted to see where things go. So they brought us everything, toys, shoes, uh, banana peel. I've got a tiny banana peel. But then we asked all those volunteers with their tag trash to throw it away as they normally would, be it recycle or through normal trash, to see what would happen. So this is the day of deployment. You can actually see the footprint of waste um, in Seattle, going to regional recycling facilities, but also to the incineration plant. But as time went on, the map kept growing. Literally no one had seen this map before. No one from Seattle, no one from government, no one from waste management. Just because data is lost, all the contractors and subcontractors we, we use, we lose data at every point. And the fact that two months later, things were still moving across the continent. So when we think about the new opportunities of a smart city, what does that mean for you? Particularly when you get a map of your own waste. You know, we could actually see where everything is going. Even silly things like two toner cartridges for your printer. Both ended up in Baja, California. One went down the Pacific Coast, one went to Minneapolis and to Chicago, then back to Mexico. That's insane. But the amazing thing is because of the trajectories, you could actually see how they moved. The shorter one went by truck, the longer one went by train, the longer one actually had a smaller carbon footprint. So when we think about efficiency, what does that mean? We actually had a woman tell us that looking at her map, she noticed that a plastic water bottle somehow ended up in the landfill. And she said that she can't look at her daughter and, 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 and reasonably say that because of her laziness, this is something that you will have to deal with. So she just wore off plastic water bottles. That changes behavior. But of course we know things don't stay in the continent. This is actually something we're showing for the first time, uh, electronic waste, where we're actually now tracking ele electronic waste around the world. In theory, CRTs are supposed to be um, processed in the United States before being sent overseas. Um, but we're actually finding this case, in this case, a screen from Oxford, Michigan, traveling to Mexico, back to the United States. And then you'll actually see a moment going to, to California. We actually planted little cameras to actually see what's going on. So actually, things talking back to us give us a whole new picture of us as citizens. The last project I'll show, um, which is something that we're doing right now, um, is actually looking at a bigger problem, uh, public health. You know, we've done some work looking at water quality. It's kind of the staple of, of you know, environmental health in cities. We look at the health of our waterways. But we want to look at maybe something a little bit different, a different waterway. If you think about public health, what happened a few years ago the United States freaked out about Ebola. We had a total of six cases in the United States. And you know, the governor of New Jersey you know, suspended habeas corpus, locked this poor woman up in the airport, all of this stuff. And yet, in the United States, about 10% of the population has diabetes. Eight million people don't even know it. That is a public health disaster. So how do we begin to measure this? Well, we're looking both within you and kind of at the city scale. Because if you think about it, the bacteria in your stomach, you have 10 times more DNA in your stomach with your microbiome, those little microorganisms, than you have that compose you as a human being. Those are the first things that are fighting the diseases that are in your body. Those are the things that are dying off when you have diabetes. So can we actually measure the collective gut of a neighborhood? So we're actually deploying sensors into our sewer system at you know, certain catching points. In this case, our first, um, first go around is in Cambridge in an automated way to actually look at this DNA that we are um, kind of putting into the, the infrastructure to actually measure that public health, to actually measure who has higher pregnancy rates, Harvard or MIT? The answer is Harvard. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
But of course, you know, we're, um, so this is actually uh, just a few months ago. This was round one of us dealing with the sewers. Poor Nusha, who's a project lead for this project, actually got sewage on her. So what we do for science, yeah. Um, but actually what you see now are the probes that are uh, going into the sewers of Cambridge right now. Uh, our first prototype on the left, Mario, and the one on the right, Luigi. Um, so Luigi's actually in the sewers of Cambridge right now, measuring uh, the, the, the microbiome of the community to actually measure public health in real time, uh, which is actually pretty powerful. So hopefully from devices that talk to each other to sensor networks to new opportunities in mobility, this gives you a framework of what kind of some of the technology that may be coming down the pike in just a few years time, about five to 10 years out. And I think my colleagues will actually show you kind of uh, in their own uh, perspective the frontiers that you're going to actually probably see a little bit sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I'd like to ask my friend Dr. Catano to come up and uh, present some of the findings. I know you're going to be uh, presenting the, uh, um, I think the PowerPoint is up. The, uh, from our report. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I will show some of the highlights from the Smart Cities chapter of our joint CSIS JICA Research Institute report, Transformative Innovation for International Development. Uh, my special thanks uh, are to uh, CSIS partner, uh, Dan, Helen, and Charles uh, for their dedicating uh, to uh, complete this report. And also I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, including uh, Akio and uh, Sayuri uh, in JICA uh, for uh, their input. And uh, uh, this report was result of the year of, of collaboration between our two institutions. And it comes at a time when both the United States and Japan have embraced the power of transformative innovation in the international development agendas. Our research was guided by the assertion that it is important that international development stakeholders understand the potential of operationalizing transformative innovation approaches, including smart cities, especially and more countries uh, move into middle income uh, status and are looking for new paths towards economic growth. Recent history has seen the emergence of new industries and exploding technologies that are transforming the world and uh, also changing the co context for international development. Uh, Klaus uh, Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of World Economic Forum, has written that world is entering a fourth industrial revolution. Uh, transformative innovation is system level innovation that shifts uh, the existing system toward a totally new and sustainable way of operating. One can look to the rise of the internet in the 1990s as an example of this kind of transformation. Importantly, transformation innovation approaches can enable a new path to prosperity in developing countries. First, uh, I will provide some background on urbanization, which uh, demonstrates the importance of building small cities. Today, over half of the total uh, human population lives in an urban setting. This is a radical shift with large implications for governance, economic growth, health, and security. The United Nations estimates that an urban population will grow by an additional 2.5 billion people by 2050, with nearly 90% of that growth occurring in Africa and Asia. Managing urban growth, particularly the uh, further city expansions that are uh, common in developing countries, will be one of the most critical challenges of the coming century. Smart city technologies 
can promote growth that is sustainable, energy efficient, and environmentally conscious. Te these technologies are critical tool for transforming urbanization from a challenging to global social dividend. JICA, RI, and CSIS use this chart to demonstrate what is involved in a smart city. At root, smart cities require three components. First is effective governance in public safety. City planning and operations and government and agency administration. Next is quality infrastructure, as Dan had emphasized, uh, that enable economic productivity, inclusive growth, and resilience. This includes infrastructure that provides energy, transportation, and water. Finally, smart cities support the needs of each citizen through social programs, healthcare, and education. These services promote an inclusive society. The momentum uh, behind smart cities in developing countries have been building. The development of smart cities requires strong collaboration between the private and public sectors. Most innovations in data collection and data systems uh, originate from the private sector and require cooperative government policy to be implemented on a city-wide scale. At the same time, efforts by bilateral donors and multilateral organizations can catalyze adoption of smart cities approaches through early stage funding and capacity building. In particular, uh, there has been a recent increased focus on equity, uh, quality uh, infrastructure. Now I will talk about the case study that we undertook to consider the how of operationalizing smart cities in a country where the United States and Japan demonstrated leaders in innovation have significant development engagement in Indonesia. First, some background on Jakarta, uh, one of the world's mega cities with a population of more than 10 million. The larger Jakarta metropolitan area, Jabodabek, has a population of more than 28 million. Jakarta's population uh, continues to grow rapidly, and uh, this population expansion has taxed uh, an already weak local infrastructure base, causing high traffic congestion, environmental concerns, and gaps in provision of essential services, including portable water, sanitation, and energy. This is a map of the Jakarta metropolitan area with 50 uh, kilometers. Uh, despite these challenges, several facets of Jakarta provide an enabling environment for a smart cities approach. This includes strong political leadership and movement towards capable public administration, desire from the people for good services delivery, and high number of smartphone and social media users. Various entities in Jakarta are pursuing vehicles to make the city a higher quality and more productive place to live. I will now describe some notable smart cities approaches in Jakarta that our report considers. The first is uh, the Jakarta Smart City Unit. This photo shows the main control screen at the unit, which is uh, housed in the city government. The unit is collecting big data and processing it to drive accountable governance and improve services delivery. A city monitoring system shows traffic conditions in Jakarta, tracks government staff in the field, accesses city fees, which are approximately 600 locations with government cameras, and monitors uh, complaints from the smartphone application called Clue. It's important to note that responding to these requests requires capable public administration, and the people was, who we spoke with in Jakarta said this is more or less the case. 
Next, I will talk about the joint crediting mechanism, or JCM, which is an approach in the energy sector. So JCM is an authoritative carbon trade scheme that promotes cooperation among Japanese and Indonesian companies. So it's a bilateral scheme. JCM uh, incentivizes Indonesian companies through subsidies to take up Japanese technologies in their business operations that achieve greater energy efficiency, uh, low carbon, enable or climate change mitigation, or make use of renewable energy. There are currently 23 projects in the JCM pipeline in Indonesia. As donor funds are limited, uh, consideration of the payback period for these kinds of schemes and how to ver <coughs> viably uh, scale them uh, should be a key consideration in encouraging take up of new technologies. Next, I will uh, talk about the mass transit project in Jakarta, which is an approach in the transportation sector. So these photos show a sealed tunnel and the compression image of a station. The Jakarta MRT, uh, which will span uh, about 16 kilometers, will uh, provide a modern and technologically advanced alternative to vehicles when it opens in two, 2019. It is the first tunnel to be built of its kind in Indonesia. Construction utilities uh, utilizes four Japanese supervisors and about 1,000 local workers, all of whom are trained to work in the tunnel, either in Singapore or on site. JAIC has been involved in this project for about 15 years and is funding almost entirely the 1.4 billion US dollars cost. It is important to note that it will take time for the MRT to have a clear impact in solving Jakarta trans traffic problem as it will cover only a limited part of Jakarta initially. It is also important to consider scale and how large infrastructure project like the MRT can be sustainably financed. Finally, uh, I will discuss an approach in the education sector, the Indonesian Science Fund, ISF. This reflects Indonesia's move to middle-income country status and an increased commitment to enabling science, technology, and innovation. The IFS was launched in 2015 by Indonesian Academy of Science with support from USAID and Australian government. It is modeled on US National Science Foundation. The ISF offers three-year flexible research grants to Indonesian scientists and engineers for research that will promote innovation, technological advances, and economic prosperity. The three-year time frame is notable as existing grants from the Indonesian government span only one year. IFS, ISF plans to create specific funding models uh, framed around developing innovative res responses to Indonesia's development challenges. Oops. Okay, so based on a trip to Jakarta and other research, uh, CSS and JICA Research Institute have developed some recommendations for how various actors can support the operationalization of smart cities in developing contexts. More specific on these recommendations can be found in our report. First, uh, developing country governments, these governments can first plan and prioritize uh, development projects and determine gaps that can be filled through foreign partnership. Next, pursue schemes that facilitate joint ventures between local companies and those in developed countries. And finally, consider how big data can catalyze the better coordination and delivery of public services. Next, uh, bilateral donors and multilateral organizations these actors can first uh, develop and promote a smart cities ranking that will assist and incentivize cities to benchmark their performance against other cities 
and measure their effectiveness with key performance indicators. And next, uh, support city and national governments to improve their capacity to collect, analyze, and operationalize big data for improved services de delivery. And next, provide catalytic funding and capacity building for the implementation of smart city technologies in developing countries. And finally, promote quality infrastructure. Now I will conclude with some key takeaways for operationalizing smart cities in developing con contexts. First, a smart cities approach can enable a highly urbanizing context to improve services delivery through the application of innovative technologies. Importantly, smart cities require capable public administration as a match to new technology. Finally, new technologies are often expensive for actors in developing countries and donor funding is limited. Sustainable ways of scaling these initiatives are needed. So thank you very much and I hope, hope you will read the report which is available here today and also in the CSIS website. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, what I was struck by was, uh, hey, Charles, can you help me bring this down? Yeah, yeah. The, what I was struck by was the, um, when we visited Indonesia was the, um, we asked different people what a smart city was and we got 12 different answers and we asked this question. Um, we've got a panel of some very thoughtful folks. We have uh, my new friend, Masa Shinozaki, who's the executive vice president, and he's the general manager at Mitsui and Company here in Washington. Uh, Matthew Devlin, who's the international relations lead at Uber. I think you've probably heard of Uber. Uh, I used it this morning, I want you to know. And uh, we have Anthony Vanke, you heard from earlier, uh, who's at Sense Sensibility at, in, at MIT, which I thought was a very interesting presentation. So could I ask each of you first, do we, we have our take, the JICA put together a very interesting gr graphic about what a smart city is. Can I ask each of you just to tell me what, when you hear the term smart city, what your reaction is? I'm to start with Masa. Hi. Um, one of the things which is very important is um, the collaboration between the private sectors and, and local government and local authorities. Uh, any smart city project couldn't be successful without uh, a, a good collaboration between pri private sectors and local uh, government and the authorities. Um, in that context, the local government uh, should uh, show the leadership to uh, tell us, tell the uh, private sectors uh, what the needs and what the agenda for the for that specific region is, and then private sectors can work on that with the technology and things. So, the cooperation and collaboration of private sector and public sector, especially the local government, it's very important. Okay. Matthew, what's a, what is a smart city for you? Uh, I generally leave the, the, those questions for Anthony, you know, he knows, <laughs> knows what he's talking about, but um, I, feel, I feel we do have to set some parameters on this term, right? And, 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 and for, for me, it's always been essentially uh, technology is really going to be at the, at the heart of this one way or the other. That's, that's irreducible. And so the question, the interesting question is, is how can governments, the social sector, the private sector, use technology to ensure that we capture for more people and, and more fully the benefits that come with urbanization? There's agglomeration economies we all know and love. And the flip side of that is how can we use technology to mitigate some of those negative externalities? That's the lens through which I think about smart cities. And Tomasa's great point there, um, there's a, there's an important, one of the many roles for government, an important one is, is appreciating that the technology advances quickly and a, a lot more, and usually a lot quicker than regulation does. And so it's incumbent upon governments at the city, uh, subnational and national level, to continuously review and update regulation to ensure that it's actually serving the public interest in light of technology that's so rapidly evolving. So I think that is also a, a key part of making sure that cities remain smart. Okay, so what, what is your take on a smart city, Anthony? You know, I think to your last point about... It, it's the having problem. sensors to, to trace sewage. Sewage and health and, right. you know, all of that, knowing what you ate for dinner. Oh, my word. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. I just sort of just kind of took that in. I just... 
I know it's it, it's going to tell us something, but you, you guys, you know, really suffer for your science. You we know? do suffer. Nusha suffered more oh, than many word. other people. Yes. Getting a little um, a little more feedback as a physical feedback. I yeah. Think. But you know, all of this, and I think the technologies, uh, I think ultimately serve a purpose of supporting the public good. I think that the main word in smart cities isn't smart, it's actually cities. What are cities? It's the places in which we live, and we hope that the places in which we live, work, and play are also places where we find opportunity, we find uh, a place where we can thrive, we can enjoy, we can live a better quality of life. But also cities have challenges, and I think the technology is an enabler to find solutions. Not that any one will be a silver bullet, not any one technology will be uh, the kind of end all be all, you know, to solve all the problems, but that it, the city is a platform, hopefully, where technology can actually improve the lives of others. That also, I think, you know, doesn't mean that the technology is necessarily always coming from the top. You know, the other thing that comes to my mind about smart cities, which is a dystopian, is a Robert Moses view that, you know, a few using the best technology we have can improve the city. And look what happened with, you know, the interstate system going through our inner cities. Actually, I was talking to a few people about this earlier, that all the best intentions that really kind of hurt our center cities in the 60s in the United States and have continued as its legacy around the world were all of the best intentions using the best technology at the time. So it's also how do we hopefully learn from the lessons of the past to use technology in a way that actually really does focus on maybe some of the values that that community has, whatever those values may be, from the top down or from the bottom. Can I, can I just ask something else? Uh, what I think is interesting is, um, I know we're gonna have, I wanna hear from, from both of you, you're gonna have some presentations, but I just, I just think the, um, what was interesting, we were having a conversation at lunch about the issue of you need technology, you need a capable government that's responsive, you need quality infrastructure, which is something that has a lot, there's, that term has a lot of things baked in the concept of quality infrastructure. But I think what was interesting in the, the conversation we were having at lunch was about the issue of, of accountability or accountable governance. So the good news is, okay, if, you, if, if I've got a sensor that says, hey, um, the traffic light is broken, if you're the government, you better fix the traffic light or you're going to get voted out or, or even in non-democratic societies. I think, I, I think what's particularly interesting, this is just Dan putting, putting his values out on the table, is I think it'll be particularly interesting in non-democratic societies, whether it's, you know, kind of, you know, you know either with who want to have more efficient government or governance. There's also a feedback loop or an accountability feedback loop as well that you're going to start hearing a lot more from your citizenry if you want to apply technologies like this. So I think you better be ready as a political, political leadership to, 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 to get a lot more feedback than, than you used to get in terms of you better fix that pothole or you better fix that, uh, that traffic light. So I do think it's, it's a two-way street. The good news is, is you're getting data, but you're also getting feedback and there's also potentially the opportunity for accountability. Now, I also think there's perhaps, there's the dark side of, the, of, of whether it, it, it has some impact on people's personal liberty or not. I think that's another thing for us to, to think about. Um, I know that, Matthew, you were gonna make some comments, so I, I was gonna, if you wanna do it from the podium, we can put that back up there, or if you wanna, if you wanna do it from the chair, either way. On the, on the, on the podium. You wanna do it in the yeah, podium, yeah. yeah. Okay, so why don't, but I think we're gonna have you go first, Matthew, and then we'll have, we'll have uh, Massa afterwards. Go okay. ahead, Matthew. Yeah, I, I actually brought a pen to a PowerPoint fight, so I might just stand <laughs> You brought stand a pen to here. a PowerPoint fight, then stay there, yeah, um, we'll put it up in a minute. But bear with me, we'll, we'll get through this together, I promise. <laughs> um, so I just want you to know I love Uber. And you didn't pay me to say that. I just want you to know. I use it all the time. Uh, can we end there? Yes. <laughs> we, that's, this was a great conversation. Exactly. Um, no. um, so for, for those yeah, just explain what is Uber. And yes. I also think what, what blows my mind is how you guys frame how you think about your markets. Sure. Um, so Uber, for, for those who aren't familiar, is a smartphone-based platform that connects riders with drivers, very simply. And so the company was founded in San Francisco in 2009, and today we're in more than 400 cities worldwide. Okay, so just stop right there, right? You're in more than 400 cities worldwide. You don't consider countries your markets. You consider cities your markets. You're the first company I've ever heard of in my entire life that thinks about cities as your markets, not countries as your markets, right? Yeah, and this, this actually often throws people when they ask, where are you? And I just start going on this, this laundry list of cities, many of which some people haven't heard, it's, it's an entirely different kind of view on the world. Um, but across those 400 cities, we, um, 
and so two of which are, of course, Manila and Jakarta. Um, Manila, we entered in January 2014, and Jakarta, August 2014. Um, but globally, we now do more than 5 million trips on the platform every day. Uh, around the world. Around the world. Yeah. And more than a million people work on the platform. Um, and so how I see Uber, um, the reason why I think Uber is so relevant to this conversation is because it goes to exactly this question about how do we use technology to maximize the benefits of these urban agglomerations and, and mitigate the negative externalities. I think the most logical place to start thinking about the, the benefits and maximizing them is, of course, from the, the writer perspective. So in, be it Manila or Jakarta, getting from A to B is often the central drama of one's daily existence, right? That'll set the tone for how the rest of your day goes. But in Manila and Jakarta today, just as in Washington, New York, or London, you can op open Uber's app, it's the exact same technology and it's the exact same experience. You, you press a button and you get a ride. And so what that's doing is that's bringing reliable access to transportation to parts of these cities that simply didn't have it before. And there's a robust body of research around what access to transportation does in terms of one's economic prospects, and then also, of course, in terms of the ability of people to engage in a meaningful way in the, the social and civic life of the city they're in. Of course, these are the exact same reasons we kind of co uh, uh, all, all press up against each other on hot, humid summer days. It's there are actually benefits to these human interactions. Uh, and so, I actually like being in a car by myself. I actually don't want to do the whole ride share Good. thing. I just want to put it out there, Anthony. I'm not, I'm not going to share any rides anybody. I can understand it yeah. on a day like today. Yeah. Um, but so to the extent platforms like Uber can increase access to transportation, they can help build more inclusive cities. And I think that really breaks down the three key parts of that. One is using technology to increase the efficiency of a system. Once you increase the efficiency of a system, we can, of course, of course start reducing prices. And when it becomes more affordable, you considerably increase the population who can access this service. Um, the other step is using technology to expand the geographic coverage, right? Because of ubiquitous connectivity and, and GPS and the smartphones that Anthony pointed out having more power than the, com the computers that sent the Apollo mission up, uh, there's no need for drivers to congregate in the heavily trafficked, more wealthy central business districts of cities. Uh, people can profitably drive on, an, on the on the Uber platform in peripheral parts of the city. And so in Jakarta, for example, we actually see that about a quarter of all trips on the platform are happening in the peripheries of the city. Um, and third and, and last, I would say, it's using technology to, to increase safety. Um, and so, of course, what we want to do is make sure that if you can increase safety in transportation, you can ensure that insecurity is no longer a barrier to those opportunities just because of virtue of someone's gender or, or age. Or, or any other reason why the, tra the transportation in the urban setting has historically kind of been a problem for a lot of groups. Can I just, so if I wanted to request a female driver, if I was a female, not me, but like if I'm a female and I'm driving, you know, and I want to feel safer, how do you, how, is that legal? Can you do that? Can you say I'd like a female driver? So there's actually an interesting case, I believe it's in Boston at the moment, that that would, that would not really... Well, it's illegal, a question, right? There's an interesting legal question in the It's United like a States. civil rights thing, it right? Are you discriminating? It would be discriminatory. But of course, that's actually, that's, that's the far less and ambitious and Next thing you know, you're going to say, I want, I want English-only folks to, to cut my, my lawn or and something like that. And I think more like importantly, that, right? I mean, it's, rides, it's, it's, rides it's, should be safe for everyone, right? Uh, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of any other characteristic. And so our focus is very much, regardless of who gets in the ride, what can we do, what technology features can we put in place to ensure that safety is heightened. And so now, when you get in a, in a car in Jakarta, uh, you watch that car arrive, you know exactly which car it is, you see a photo of the driver, the name, the license plate number, uh, that driver's been vetted, passed background checks. As you travel, you can follow it on a map so you know you're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. You can share real-time uh, route location with people in your contact list. And of course, if anything happens, there's full accountability. Everyone's identified, both you, one to the other. You know, I buy all that, but my aunt, for example, who's from a small town in, in the Midwest, came to DC and is like, I'm, I'm afraid to use Uber. What is your answer to her? What would you has say she, to her? Has she tried Uber? No, she hasn't tried Uber, but it's, it's, like, a, it's like a mindset issue, right? And so how, what do I say? I'm a female, I'm concerned about some sketchy guy, it's not regulated. What's your, what's your reaction to that? I, I don't have any problem with it, but I, didn't, I, I tried to go through the usual arguments and she, she knew she wanted to do it, but then she had like all these 
these, because I think, and I think that's, I don't think she's the only one that has that. What's, how do you respond to that? Sure, well firstly, I mean, safety is really, there's the tripartite division to it. There's what you can do before, during, and after the ride. And, and so before, it's a matter of background screening. I mean, you look at, look at people's criminal history, look at their driving record, make sure that they have a clean driving record. Once you're on the platform, make sure that people are getting in a car with exactly the driver they, they know and, and should be in. And again, it's really the after part as well. It's the deterrent effect, right? A lot of traditional safety mechanisms front load all the work, right? It's you get one bite at the safety apple mm -hmm. up front. But given new technology and the accountability and transparency that it introduces, that's no longer the case. Right? You can establish a continuous deterrent effect so that both parties to the transaction on the platform, both the rider and the driver, know that whatever happens, they'll be held fully accountable. And so that's, it's that transparency that really distinguishes it. Well, let me ask you this. What, what does Uber want from city governments? What does Uber need from, need from city governments? Usually, when we, when we arrive in a city, unsurprisingly, regulation that was written 10, 20, 30 years ago, years ago doesn't exactly contemplate our technology. And so there's a, there's a, there's a conversation there about how, what are the, first of all, what are the fundamental principles that should guide regulation? What is the purpose of regulation? What do you want your transportation system to achieve in your city? Uh, do you want it to increase transportation access for people? Do you want to protect the incumbent industry. I would argue you shouldn't. But again, what are the fundamental principles? And once you establish those, what f flows from that is rather straightforward, I think. You don't want unnecessary barriers to market entry. Uh, there's no need for it. Certain things are no longer uh, necessary in, given new technology. And a good example is, is price flexibility. So usually when you get in a taxi, you have a schedule fare, and the price is set. And that, of course, is a reasonable uh, previous response to an information asymmetry. If I get in a cab in DC, I'm not from DC, I have no idea what the price should really be, and I can, I can be ripped off. But when you open the Uber app, for example, you can get an estimate of exactly what the, the fare will be. And so if you remove the problem, you can in turn remove the, the, the now anachronistic patch on it. And so it's really a matter of updating regulation to be an appropriate fit to the activity as it exists today. Okay. Great, thank you. That's great. Um, let me just, I, I do want to take advantage of this since I love Uber so much and take advantage of you being here. So um, I go to all over the world. I've used Uber probably, and you can quote me on this. I've used it on 15 different cities. I'm very happy with the service. I, there's any number of different places in the world you get all sorts of pushback from taxi unions or sometimes governments. I think it's misguided personally. I don't say that to the taxi driver when I'm in a car with them and they complain because uh, I want them to get me to my destination. How, how are you all dealing with sort of either interest group pushback or let's call it old think government pushback who are comfortable with either in, in cahoots with interest groups or are just they want to keep the 100 year old, uh, you know, they don't want to have the gig economy for whatever reasons, if I can put it that way. Sure. Um, so I think largely it's an educational mission. I think on the on people, traditional transportation providers in all this, all the cities we enter, I think an important uh, first thing to understand about the platform is it's an open platform. People are free to join. So if you've been driving for a living in a city before Uber's arrival, we'd very much like you to drive on the platform after our arrival, right? And there are benefits to using our, our technology to do so. In terms of the government's perspective, I think it's actually really explaining the fact first that regulation that may have served a purpose in the past and may have been very well intended and, and oriented towards the public interest might no longer be the optimal set of regulation in light of new technology. And that's understandable. I think that's a natural uh, conversation to have. It's not particular to our technology. It's not particular to our industry, right? And so, again, I think the, what, what it falls to us is, again, set out the benefits that flow from updating regulation. Well, I, I completely agree. I, I will say it's night and day. Uh, I find that surly cab drivers, I have a lot less tolerance for them now that, I've, now that there's been Uber. Well, the good, the good news about that is there's been some work done um, 
here in, here in DC actually looking at what competition, the entry of Uber to a market does for the quality of service from taxis. Yeah. And so I think it was New York City where it was looked at where Uber's entry actually uh, resulted in a decline in complaints against taxi drivers. So you can infer from that that the increased competition uh, taxi drivers were facing were actually causing to the up their game. Well, what do you know? Markets sometimes do work. I like it. That's great. That's what I'm all about. So good. Well, look, my friend uh, Masa Shinozaki, come on up here, and uh, you have some prepared remarks. Um, you know, one of the things that I was taking with in our work with JICA RI, we spent a lot of time in, in, in Jakarta looking at various Japanese technologies to make cities more livable. So air conditioning, refrigeration units, sensors, so a big part of making a smart city smart or a city more livable is sort of applying all sorts of technologies. And I know that Mitsui is a manufacturer of those sorts of technologies. So thanks for being with us, Masa. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, we talk a lot about the election these days. But uh, today I'm going to talk about smart city. It's a <laughs> much better subject, maybe. Much better a subject. More predictable subject than the smart people in politics. Oh, my word. I don't know about that. It, 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 is that like smart cities and smart people in politics? That's a bad, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Mitsui's uh, smart city project in Malaysia today. Um, let me um, first show you a short YouTube video of the project to give you an overall image of the smart city. Metropolis. We present to you an iconic development. Iconic. And close to international airport. Strategically located in the heart of Nusa Dagger. is right next to the Second Link Expressway. 15 minutes from Singapore. Vital arteries complete the loop with the new coastal highway. Medini Iskandar is close to Columbia Asia Hospital, Horizon Hills, Edu City, Kota Iskandar, Johor's new administrative center, Putri Harbor, One Medini Residential Development, TriStar Residential Development, Primary Trust Medini Residences Office Towers Two chic residential precincts nearby Medical facilities And a contemporary hotel This distinctive enclave is served by world-class facilities and infrastructure Legoland Malaysia Asia's first Legoland Lifestyle Mall and Theme Park Hotel. A new landmark set to arise. By the end of 2013, these exciting developments will create substantial economic growth. State-of-the-art facilities create an ideal venue for world-class events between east-west trade routes and Asia's burgeoning economies. The green block comes with a spectacular and voluminous space. Unique glass ceilings bathe the interior with natural light. The architecture is simple but modern with a universal appeal. Through glass doors, you will arrive and be awe-inspired by the opulent views. 
The glass walls draw the outdoors into the interior space. The angle of the towers is positioned to minimize cross viewing as occupants are treated to stunning and uninterrupted views of the landscaped theme park and lush gardens. This is the world that embraces you at Medini Iskander. A lifestyle experience that enhances your creativity. Set in an investment friendly and green environment. It offers a competitive edge to the wise investors. A model for smart, sustainable growth for years to come. This is Medini Iskander, Malaysia. You still have slots available? It looks very livable. It looks great. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm taking now, my kids to the Legoland. That's excellent. Right. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of fun. You, now you've just uh, watched the fun part. And, uh, and then I'll talk a little more about the details of the Over Smart City project. We um, participated in, uh, mas as, a, as a master developer in a gigantic smart city project called Iskandar Smart City Project in Malaysia back in 2013. Now playing an active role in the project, especially in smart initiatives. This is the image of our concept of, of a smart city. Uh, the city has office buildings, shopping and entertainment areas, uh, medical care facilities, all kinds of utilities, data center, uh, energy management systems, urban transportation, and smart residence clusters. This is a bird's eye view of the Iskandar project area. Let me now um, talk about the details of the project. As I mentioned, Mitsui uh, joined the project in 2013 to develop the area called Medini in Johor in the south of Malaysia with uh, the other partners in the country. The project itself had commenced back in 2007 and was planned to continue for over 25 years. Mm. Uh, our, our basic concepts are develop a sustainable and eco-friendly smart city with advanced information and communication technologies, achieve high energy efficiency, uh, employing smart grids and smart meters. Uh, create a pleasant urban lifestyle with uh, innovative ideas such as electric vehicle sharing, electronic money, and town portal site services. The Iskandar's whole area is about three times the size of Singapore, and the projected population in 2025 is three million from the current 1.7 million. The Malaysian government has been supporting the project from a long-term perspective um, through its policies to enhance the infrastructure and develop the science, technology, engineering, and people's advanced skills. The Iskandar area is located in the south of Malaysia, facing Singapore. The Medini area is part of a broader Nusanjaya area in the south. The Nusanjaya area is the B area. You, you see A, B, C, D, D, B area in this map near the border with Singapore. The Nusanjaya area is a flagship zone covering an area of 24,000 acres. This area is the key driver of the Iskandar project and has transportation, utilities, and telecommunication infrastructure, and also an education center, 
healthcare facilities, state administration, and commerce and services industry. Medini is a core area of the Nusanjaya zone and has good access to various spots and facilities. Medini has amusement facilities called Legoland yeah. and uh, hospitals and residential clusters surrounded by education centers called Edu City, uh, Creative Business Hub, Pinewood Studio, and so on. The residential clusters, uh, shopping malls, and the entertainment park, uh, amusement park, Legoland, have been completed. More smart facilities are under construction by other developers. Let me close my uh, presentation by showing the key factors of our smart city project. First, we aim to create a low carbon city by developing smart grid, with home and business energy management system. The second factor is comfort of life, managing infrastructure facilities to achieve safety and adequate security. The third factor is a sustainable development, advanced at each phase with effective management of wastewater and sewage system. Those factors are supported by financial and ITC services, and above, above all, by high quality integrated township management we have developed. Medini is a pilot project of Smart City. I'll stop here, okay. thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I think, I think one of the things for us to be thinking about as we think about applying technology to urbanization is that uh, it's, it's going to be applied in all sorts of ways we're not thinking about, but that you're going to need uh, capable leadership and capable management to actually do something with it, and that the technology is about making the lives of people more, more livable and more and making, making living in a particular city more attractive. I do think that, uh, for example, I, I, when I, what I was struck when I was in Jakarta, I must have had a half dozen conversations about Beijing. And why did Beijing keep coming up? People said, oh, I, I'm, I've gotten out of Beijing. I don't want to live in Beijing because the air quality is so horrible. And so I do think these issues of quality of life and managing, using technology to do that uh, is something that is going to be uh, necessary uh, to to make cities more livable, but it's ultimately the, the main goal is to make cities attractive and livable and manageable. And so uh, I think this is a very interesting example of sort of a of a blue sky creating a city a, a city from whole cloth. Um, so it's it's very very interesting, and so um, I'm, it, it looks very attractive. I'm definitely going to. Invest, be investing in Malaysian real estate, it sounds like. So thanks, Masa, for that. Thank you very much. I know we've got a lot of thoughtful people here in the audience. I've got, um, I'll be, I'm going to bend over here to make sure I can, can see everybody in terms of folks who want to raise their hands. I, we'd love to take some questions and comments from the audience if people want to want to do that. This gentleman here, this gentleman here, this woman here. Let's start with those and this woman here. Why don't we just do these two here and name and institution and and then just we'll, we'll bunch three or four of these together. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Alejandro Svedhelm, um, international development consulting firm, Nathan Associates. One question is, what are some existing or potential examples of the smart city uh, innovative data sharing technologies that would facilitate city, citizen engagement in the planning process of cities? So using technology to facilitate citizen engagement? Yes. OK, great. Why don't you pass the mic to your neighbor next to you? Oh, thank you. And what's your name? Uh, Laurie Krieger from the Manoff Group, working in international development and health. One of the th uh, first of all, thank you for really interesting presentations. They were really, really educational. One of the things I haven't heard is social class. I didn't say economic quintiles. That's not the same as social class, but social class. 
So in uh, Iskandar, where are the people who are going to work in the buildings, who are going to scrub the floors and deliver the food? Where are they going to live? And how is their quality of life going to be improved, for example? I also thought of the slums of Manila, where you can't get a car there, so Uber can't service them. So I just wondered how this is going to help the poor. Thank you. Interesting. This woman here. Hi, my name is Carla. I'm from Brazil. Um, I just want to ask about civil society. Uh, how can we track the trends and the needs from civil society to use the data, this data to improve our cities? Um, I know that in Sao Paulo, the city that I come, uh, Uber have to share their data with the gover government city. And how this kind of situation can help, or this is the right way to follow, to help government interact with companies? Okay, great. So a question about the role of civil society in, in, in cities. There was somebody over here, this gentleman over here. Thank you. Um, Daniel Vasquez with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Anthony, your presentation was uh, wonderful. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think there are a lot of very interesting points that you made, and, and the first, uh, or the question that I have for you is um, uh, data con collection. It seems that at the core of a smart city and planning, it's data gathering in order to be able to prepare for whatever solution you want to propose. So how expensive is this process of gathering data? And uh, I, I work a lot with uh, Latin American countries, so for them, obviously, resources is a constraint. So I don't know if you could share uh, a little bit what was behind this uh, trash exercise that you do in getting the sensors and putting there and how much would that cost and whether this is actually something that can be replicated in a larger scale. OK, thank you. So these are really interesting uh, questions. Um, I think there's a, let me just make a couple of comments. One is, um, that cities are engines of growth and can also be pools of dis epidemics that can also be p uh, sources of uh, radicalization or crime. And so managing cities and balance, making sure that cities are livable and balancing uh, different, um, different values is an, important, is an important function that city leaders have and civil society has. And it's important to create uh, ways in which that there are feedback mechanisms for that. I think, for example, the concept of Ebola's the Ebola outbreak this time uh, was, was not detected at first because it was the first time that in Liberia or in the West Africa where it had been in an urban context as opposed to a rural context. Historically, Ebola had been a disease of rural Africa, and, but now that I think more than 50% now of Africa is now urban, they were, you're now having urban doctors seeing this, and so you're seeing accelerate. The good news is we've got urbanization. There's a lot of pluses to it. The bad news is between airplanes and urbanization, you're going to have accelerated. It's a force multiplier for, for pandemics as well. So, so I do think this, uh, uh, there are lots of challenges to, to cities, including some of them that have been put on the table. So um, citizen engagement, civil society, data gathering, uh, what do we do about, how about slums and, and poverty? And um, you know, I think you could ask the same question here in Washington as well. So I think it's, these are all interesting questions. So um, let me start with you, Anthony, in terms of taking in on any of these questions. Sure. Um, you know, I think the real opportunity right now is across many, you know, the social classes, you know, socioeconomic classes globally is that the technology is getting incredibly cheap. And I think that there's a unique opportunity to leapfrog. You know, you actually look at where is there the highest cell phone penetration. It's actually not, you know, the developed Western world. It's actually a lot of the developing context for social reasons, you know, for a variety of reasons, which you actually see leapfrogging, which actually gives a lot of opportunities for new thinking, new test beds, new all of that. I think that that being said, I think one of the challenges to kind of larger scale implementation is policy. You know, if I could wave a magic wand, the thing I would love to see is a lot more governments really embracing the idea of a living laboratory. 
in whatever way makes sense to actually give opportunities for people to test these new ideas in a way that still ensures the safety, um, dealing with issues of privacy, all of that, of its citizens, but allowing people to test. I mean, one, one thing that I can say, working with the city of Cambridge with uh, the sewage, they've been incredibly gracious as hosts to say, sure, let's test it. Let's work with you to like, ensure some of the issues of privacy. Like, we want to make sure that you're not sampling right under someone's I'm, home. So I'm that trying, yeah, I'm, that's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. But, it's, but it takes a lot of bravery from the government. We've also had, actually, with the city of Quito, Ecuador, we're um, hoping to implement um, some sensors in the downtown core for a project um, leading up to um, Habitat 3. That also takes a lot Sorry, of So what's bravery. Habitat 3? Habitat 3 is the big um, kind of global forum on urbanization. Okay. Uh, and when happens, is it? It's October, I believe, late okay. October. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's late October. Okay. This year it's in Quito. Um, so we're going to just be doing a little project with uh, the city of Quito to see how kind of these new technologies can be implemented. But the unique opportunity is the technology that we're implementing, you can, mm -hmm. we're, we're literally using Raspberry Pis, which you can buy, which is a little kind of a mini computer. It's a little breadboard. It's basically- I thought you were going to discover that in the sewage. I'm just yeah, kidding. Right. Sorry. Just. Uh, in Cambridge, <laughs> not, not, not in Quito. Sorry. The diets are a little different. But, 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 you know, but this board is $30. You can buy it on Amazon. It'll get to you if you have Prime tomorrow. And you can actually have a whole system, you know, a, a little microcomputer for less than $50 with all the sensors to test it. So we're actually looking to scale. Now the challenge is, what do you do with the data? Where do we store it? That becomes a more of an infrastructural question. But at least kind of at the beginning point, the creation of new data and the sensing technology is incredibly, incredibly cheap. Can I ask, Anthony, can I ask you in Massa the issue of slums and where are people living in cities? I'm Mitsui, obviously, is a construction company. I'm an infrastructure company, among other things. But let me start with you, Anthony, in terms of what is, um, what, you know, what do we do about, we're having an increasing migration of people coming and living in many cities in the developing world. Oftentimes, they go move directly to sort of unconstructed housing. How, how should we be thinking about, how should we be applying technologies or new approaches to the issue of housing and slums in, in, in poor communities? How should we be thinking about that? I mean, one of the most interesting things, interesting projects I think anywhere in the world is just the kite mapping. Literally it's people putting digital cameras with GPS things and flying them on kites, taking a picture. Because then you get a map of property rights, you know, in the developing world. Wow, someone actually lives there. And then you can actually see where the roads are. You know, I don't think that's gonna be the end all be all, but I think- Not, not constructed roads, but like informal roads, informal like dirt roads. Informal roads, yeah. Because I think, you know, Historically, cities have been kind of these organic, messy structures, and then Baron Haussmann kind of went through and bulldozed the grand, you know, boulevards in Paris and all that. But the idea of the city as an organic entity is actually kind of a much older idea, and with that actually comes a lot of problems with informal housing. It, it's happened everywhere, you know, New York, including everything. Forever. But knowing some information actually can help us identify some of the bigger problems of okay, where is wastewater collecting that might actually lead to disease outbreak? And I think we can be smart about it. I don't think this is a problem that we're gonna easily solve. I think that, that is, this is a grand challenge for humanity. But I think that we can, act, we can begin to use technologies in very simple ways to actually help improve the status before we can actually ask the questions of how right. does development play into this? Right. Do, so we, it, do we be, be preemptive? An app, an app isn't going to solve the issues of, of poverty or inequality on its own. But it right? can at least kind of increase the, the welfare, the, the, okay. kind of the health and welfare of, of people, where we can already start. And I mean, the other powerful side is that we actually begin to know the movement patterns of people. One project I didn't show with the cell phone, we showed a little bit in Singapore, but you know, actually using cell phone data to see the migra migratory patterns of people. You know, but if you look at that over time, because we all have this, mm. and in an anonymized way, we can actually see what those patterns are of people you know, moving in countries. So, so Masa, what is, what, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna house people that are moving to cities in uh, kind of low-cost housing? What is that gonna look like in the future? Right, uh, let me address that issue uh, this way. Um, one of the things we often forget is what the goal of smart cities is. Um, the goal is not to, sh to show the technologies, or technology is the core of smart cities. But it, that's not the goal. That's not the objective. The objective is to to make people's life comfortable and happy. So and you know, get rid of the poor and things. So um, to ad address that kind of social economic issue, we need the help of the local government, and the local government needs to have a long-term policy to make people's life happy, comfortable, 
um, and, and, and the private sectors uh, or the companies can help uh, the local society but, but it's a role for government. With the yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think Masa, I think you're right. I mean, I think that's my point about urbanization is is we can't operate as if technology on its own. It, you need government continue government and good governance still has a role, and all, that that public policy still matters even in an age of new whiz bang technologies or even in an age of big data. My point is. We're going to need capable governments to, to to ultimately create public policies or to, to be aware of things like how are we going to deal with things like sewage or trash collection or roads or paying for basic and running and providing basic services that could be themselves or could be privatized but could be managed or regulated by state health and education etc. So I do think there is a your point is this is a role for public policy and for government and that's ultimately where that's that's going to be. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me ask, I want to ask uh, my friend from Uber, and I'd also welcome your, your thoughts as well about the issue of data gathering. There was a conversation about data and data gathering. So Matthew, I'm assuming you guys collect, I'm guessing you guys collect a lot of data at Uber. Is that, is that a fair statement? And what do you do with it? Yeah, I want to sneak in a quick comment about the um, access to less advantaged communities and the use of these, because I think it's important. OK. Um, I'll be brief. But again, the, the model is really essentially increasing efficiency and passing on those gains in more affordable prices. Right? So that's inherently geared towards people who have been priced out of this transportation market historically. And so you might be surprised, but we actually do a, a, a significant and growing business in parts of Mexico City, Manila, Johannesburg, Cairo that you wouldn't otherwise expect are, are markets for us. And then, of course, this is a technology that's kind of layered on top of an, an existing transportation provider system. And so we, it's, it's, in some ways, it's localized quite heavily. So using cash, whereas in, in, in Washington, it's charged to your credit card. In they, Man they do they use, they use cash in some In of Manila, market? you can settle with cash. In Nairobi, you can settle with cash. So what that does for the ridership base, of course, it grows it enormously. And you see a lot of that growth happening in those, those less advantaged neighborhoods in these cities. Uh, where there isn't a road at all, we do run up to, against some limitations. I mean, interestingly, we now have motorcycles on our platform. Really? Uh, in, yeah. And so they'll get you to a lot of places, as, as you all know. Um, on the data issue, of course, there is value for governments and city governments to have data for urban planning. I think what needs to, where we need some work is actually an articulation of what type of data is valuable for what. Right. And so often there's a default uh, assumption. I'd be interested to hear Anthony's thoughts on this is data is for data's sake, right? And just, we just need endless amounts of data. And so I think we first need a conversation about what data and, and why. Um, and then a, a couple of caveats I'd, I'd just frame, frame this conversation. One is this raises the serious privacy concerns that we have to be con conscious yeah, that was, of. Yeah, that was one of my concerns yeah. downstairs at the lunch is, okay, the good news is there's a whole lot of data and it's very empowering, but the flip side is there's maybe a civil liberties component to this. And presumably, we wouldn't all want uh, a regulator to, to know exactly when we were picked up in a car, going exactly where at, at what time. And the, that can be, and even if you anonymize those data sets, we know well, that they can be de Let me just stop you there. There was, someone was telling me a story of those easy passes. I don't know if you have, e many of you have easy passes in your car. There have been a divorce cases where <laughs> The husband wasn't supposed to be where he was. He was. He was in. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let's put it that way. And went through one of those easy pass holes. And in the divorce courts, the, the evidence was he he crossed some bridge when he wasn't supposed to be crossing a bridge. Right. That's 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 an example. <laughs> that certainly is an example. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the, same the, thing with Uber. Why <laughs> why did you take this Uber from here to there at this hour? Right. And I think. And then lastly, the, there's another real concern. Is this poses. Uh, competitive concern right, for companies who are in the business of, you know, the business model is predicated on this activity and generating this data. And so governments have to, of course, be sensitive to if, we're, if, if companies are forced to turn over all this data, that could actually erode their competitive position significantly. So there's a, I think that this is obviously there is value in this data. It's just this conversation really needs to be structured and had seriously. So let me ask you, there is, there are, let me bunch together the issue of citizen engagement. There's technology for citizen engagement was the gentleman's question here, but also there's a conversation about what, how do we, how is civil society participating in, the, in civic life? So I'd love to hear from each of you about this issue of either citizen engagement or civil society when you hear those terms. And if you want to talk about how is technology being used for that, that'd be fine too. 
and let me start you with Anthony and we'll just go down each other. And it doesn't have to necessarily be about technology, but so much as how are citizens being engaged in sort of driving the, the destiny of the future of their cities? How are they being empowered or how are they participating in that? Whether it's technologically or whether it's through civil society groups or whether it's at the ballot box, et cetera. Let's go ahead, Anthony. I think it's also, you know, Ty, I think um, if, if you haven't read the report that came out with Jakarta, they were talking about fab labs in there too. And one of the things that's actually come out with this whole movement as well is globally is a movement towards citizen scientists, which is absolutely amazing that citizens with just really cool ideas and the tools that are now available to us can actually produce information. The kite mapping case I was saying, you know, with the slums, in this case it was, I think it was in Mexico. That was all citizen scientists that did that. So not only, I think, are they able to really now leverage technologies to create new data sets that can actually empower society, they are now also able, going back to that accountability, also to hold people to account with the data, either by uh, you know the traditional applications, the you know I took a phone of a pothole and it's not fixed, or a yeah, picture. I see you know an icy sidewalk, which is my case in Boston. I am the guy in my block who reports you. <laughs> you're the you icy. Know. You're the icy. Are you the? Are you the? Like yeah, yeah. if you didn't shovel your your exactly. sidewalk, are you I give the guy? You, I give you the 24 hours. If after 24 hours it's still icy, then you've put it on Facebook or yeah. what do you do? I send it to the city. There's actually an app. I mean, because it's Boston, you know, we <laughs> we that's a, this is a perennial problem. So it's actually an option. Icy sidewalk, you know. Um, so, bad neighbor. So yeah, yeah, I am that neighbor. You are uh, that neighbor. I'm the pedestrian on our street too. So it's just like <laughs> I walk. Um, but I think it's also you know what happens if your trash isn't picked up. So I think citizens can now engage in a different way. I think the other side of it too is that what policies or what infrastructure is in place to be able to leverage both the kind of creative imagination of the new ideas and to listen to the citizens when they actually have complaints about the services that they should be getting or not getting. So I think citizens are actually now more empowered than ever through this kind of democratization of information uh, to be able to participate in a different way. But, and let me just, I, when, I, when we were in Jakarta, I was struck there were a number of civil society groups saying, I'm going to take matters in my own hand. I'm going to do something on bike paths or, or, or bike transportation. So there was almost sort of, it was just a group of people that got together, don't ask me how, and they were creating either apps or sort of bringing yeah. technology, applying technology to that. So, so it's not just individuals sort of toiling away in a garage. There's sort of there's there's sort of civic. It's sort of a technology is an empowers is civic uh, civic engagement. Is that we, fair? Yeah, we had this tiny little project actually in Jakarta a few years ago, and somehow it leaked out onto Twitter that we were there and we were looking at the waste collection infrastructure. They Based heard that the that the icy sidewalk yeah, guy was coming and they should run was, away. You know, right? at you know zero <laughs> degrees, you know, south or something like that. Uh, but they actually, they reached out to us. And what we had was we actually had a conversation in a coffee shop about trash collection and just the ideas that were coming up. And we said, Jakarta doesn't need us. You know, Jakarta you've got, needs you've got, a voice for all of you. Like, because you are actually providing solutions to collect household trash in neighborhoods where you can't take a truck down. That was yeah. the exact problem because a lot of that ends up in the waterway. It's a little bit to the problem earlier about what happens when there's not a road. Yeah. But we still don't collect the trash. But, but be people have a problem. So people came together, created solutions on their own. But now can we actually leverage your collective knowledge and maybe help you scale it up mm. or find ways to actually scale it up? And I think that a is Anthony, I'm sorry, but I have to say, I, I'm thinking of William F. Buckley, may <laughs> rest in peace, where he said, I'd rather be ruled by the first thousand people in the Cambridge phone book than academics in Cambridge. So I mean, yeah, I just think course. this is sort of reflects that in terms of, <laughs> right? The the unlimited power and wisdom of of human, you know, of the human spirit, right? It, exactly. It, exhibited in Jakarta, Exhibit A to that is is your example. Exactly, here. and they know the lay of the land. I mean, you see it also in mobility as well. You know, go to Cape Town, the tacit knowledge that some of the drivers have. It was incredible. Now, you know, maybe, you know, five years, whatever. I don't know how long Uber's been in, in you know, South Africa, but however many, it took probably that much time for them to get the same tacit knowledge that drivers have been collecting intuitively, you Over know, decades. for decades. And that also is really powerful as well. That is also a data set, quote unquote. You so, know, okay, okay, so Matthew, c civil society, civic engagement, technology, how, how does that touch sure. your world? Um, well, it certainly does. I'd say the most, the most, the experience that made the, the biggest impression on me was definitely in Mexico City. And so there was a, a 
pretty robust debate over how platforms like Uber should be regulated, even whether they should be regulated in Mexico City. And what really was a tipping point there was a grassroots social media campaign among citizens of Mexico City, among users, in support of platforms like Uber ourselves, our competitors, and the need to actually regulate these so that the city could capture the full benefits. And so on, on, in the wake of that social media campaign, Mayor Mancera kind of pulled together a series of roundtables, very collaborative. It was, it was platforms, it was the incumbent taxi industry, it was civil society groups, it was transportation academics to really hash out what a regulation should look like. And then they became the first jurisdiction in Latin America to actually uh, to, to, to promulgate a, a decree that essentially targeted platforms just like Uber. So seeing that kind of civic engagement in real time and at that scale on such an actual precise issue that had such uh, tangible impact on citizens' lives. Mm. Watching that play out was, was, was very, uh, very interesting. So Masa, th talk about either citizen engagement or civil society or how, how you, you might, obviously when you do large infrastructure or large construction, you're gonna hear from, from neighbors or localities and having good relationship with them matter. Talk a little bit Absol about that. Absolutely, I mean, citizens uh, engagement in smart cities uh, very, very important. And when we design the smart city, we have to listen to their needs and agenda. Um, that's not the scientists, not, not the engineers who make the smart cities. I mean, citizens' needs and uh, desire will create the smart city. And probably you, you, when you ask 100 people, 100 different people, what kind of smart cities they want, you have 100 different smart cities. So pe people's engagement is very important to create their own smart city. Smart city in Malaysia would be different smart city mm. in China, in Africa, in uh, in South uh, in Latin America. So you should you should listen to people's needs and agenda and citizens' engagement is very very important. Well, I, th thank you, Masa. I do think what's interesting is that these new technologies that were captured in our report that we did in partnership with Jake R. I is is that this is an amplifier for people's voices and preferences. And that that is what you're going to see a lot more of it. This is a now a two-way street, and governments better be ready to hear uh, and respond because uh, they're going to, the, the people's preferences and their voices are going to be sharply attuned. And if they're not, they will, to the extent it's democratic, they'll be voted out of office. And if they're not democratically elected, um, all sorts of other consequences can happen. So thank you all for doing this. I want to thank JICA Research Institute again. Please read our report. Thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking the different contributors here today. Thanks,